Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And I wanted to talk this week about a new journey that I have embarked upon, which is to obtain a ham radio license here in the United States. I am studying for my exam right now and hope to take it in a couple of weeks. And I thought what I would do in this video is share with you what I've learned so far about the process of getting a ham license and some of my reasons why I want to get one. So let's get to it. So let's begin with the why. And I think the reason why is that I am a technology nerd, as many of you know from watching this channel. And this is an area of tech that I haven't really dived into all that much up until recently when I obtained my RTL SDR USB dongle. I've had more fun with this thing since the Mr. FPGA project came into my possession. And what's fun about this is that there's a whole world going on in the air around us that you can pull in and begin to look at and listen to. There's a lot of data floating around up there, a lot of people talking to each other, and it's kind of fun at night just to kind of explore the radio spectrum and see what my lousy antenna upstairs can pick up. And related to this, a few months back, I also saw this video on Retro Recipes channel where they actually sent a message to the ISS over packet radio using a Commodore 64. And that led to a whole big rabbit hole of research for me about how you can access the repeater on the International Space Station to communicate with other ham operators around the world or around the country. And there's a lot of just fun stuff that I think uh, this can bring. Another thing that I was interested in was helping out in my community. As many of you know, I volunteer on my local school board, but I don't have many things that I can do to lend my technical expertise to at the moment. And as it turns out, there's a great volunteer organization here in my state and across the United States called ARES, I believe is the pronunciation. And this is a group of volunteers that helps in a time of an emergency to keep communication lines going between first responders around the state. And if this is something I can help with, especially because I have a backup power generator here at my place and I'm pretty high up, I might be able to be useful to somebody. So that was another reason why I wanted to get my license, meet some of the other hams in the area and see how I might be helpful the next time we have one of these storms that knocks out power for a couple of weeks. So what do I plan to do when I acquire a ham radio license? Well, my big interest right now is in data packets. I just find it fascinating that you can send bits of data over the air without any infrastructure or internet in the middle of it. And one of the things that I've been playing around a lot with is weak signals. Uh, this is the FT8 protocol. I covered this in the uh, video I did on Saturday. And what's amazing is that even with my really lousy setup that I have upstairs, that is literally hacked together, I am picking up signals from South America, from a good chunk of the United States there, as you can see, and even Europe with the bare minimum configuration here. So I'd really like to explore this a lot more and see what I can do to reach people with very minimal power coming out of my transmitter. And of course, I have to go through a few other licenses to get down to some of the uh, longer range frequencies, but there's always a, a goal, I think, to achieve in anything that you do. Uh, the other thing that I'm interested in is another weak signal protocol called JS8. And this allows for sending longer messages like you can see here on screen using similar uh, technology here. So this is one area that I'd really like to dive into. Another one is packet radio. This is an old format. In fact, it used to be a lot more prevalent than it is now. Uh, it's largely used through this APRS system, which is a means of people kind of communicating their locations to each other. But there's also a component of packet radio where you can set up bulletin board systems. And I found this really cool demo that somebody was doing with a Raspberry Pi on YouTube that you can find at the link on screen here, lon.tv slash packet BBS. And this works a lot like the BBS systems I used to log into with a modem back when I was a kid. And one of the things that really fascinated me about the BBS world back then was that it was something that you had to find and explore. It wasn't available to everybody. And the BBS systems you logged into were local to your area because the people that typically went into those systems were people that were dialing in with a free local phone call. And so this kind of replicates that. Uh, packet radio BBSs were 
quite popular back in the 80s, around the same time BBS systems on modems were popular. And I think packet radio BBSs are due for a comeback. I was uh, just searching around over the last couple of days on this, and I'm seeing a lot of recent discussions about these things and how to get them set up. There are some that have been running for a very long period of time in different pockets of the country, and I would like to try to set one up. And the fun thing is, is that this is something that an entry-level licensee uh, with a technician license can do. So this is an area that I will be exploring. And once I figure out a path on this one after the license is acquired, it might be a fun series to do here on the channel. And I would love to run it off of a Raspberry Pi, which I think would be very well suited for this task. And one of the cool things that Kevin Hook, the person who made this video did, was pull down RSS feeds and inject them into his packet radio BBS, which for me is like connecting all the cool stuff that I've been working on lately. So this is one area that I am very interested to dive into. So how do you acquire an amateur radio license? Well, here in the United States, you take an exam administered by volunteers on behalf of the Federal Communications Commission, but other countries will have all of their own rules. So you'll need to research that in your home country. A great resource though here in the United States is the ARRL or the uh, National Association for Amateur Radio and they are actually headquartered right here in Connecticut, not far from me. So maybe we'll take a road trip and visit them at some point. I'm sure they would love to uh, chat with me as I'm going through this journey. And they have a lot of great information here, not only for people interested in becoming a ham radio operator, but for existing hams. And if you wanted to get details as to when you can take an exam, you can go to this link that you see on screen here on the ARRL site. You type in your zip code and you'll find areas where you can get your exam taken. Now, as far as preparation goes, they do have publications available that you can purchase to study for the exam. What I've been doing is going through an online course that a viewer recommended, and that course is called Ham Test Online, and Trent Curtis was the viewer that recommended it to me, and I wanna thank him, and I also wanna congratulate him because he just got his license the other day after using this to study for it. And I have found this to be incredibly helpful because I do okay with books, but I like to be quizzed along the way as I'm learning something new. And that is exactly what this ham test online does. And what's really nice about it is that if you, you know, log off and then come back in a day or two later, it recalls all the questions that you have been struggling on and puts them in front of you before you learn anything new. So it's continually trying to get you to uh, develop mastery of each of the different subject areas of the exam. And as you work your way through, it will continually bring these questions back up to make sure you develop some aptitude and knowledge about uh, all of the things that you need to know uh, to be a ham radio operator. And there's quite a bit to this. I was surprised it was as much as it was. You don't need to learn Morse code or anything, but you have to learn a lot of fundamentals about electronics and how radios work from a physics perspective. Not too much math involved, but there's a lot of concepts to understand. And believe it or not, I am not an expert on electronics or radio fundamentals. It's all pretty new to me. So this has been a real learning process here to get myself through those portions of it. I'm doing fine on the policy related questions and those sorts of things, but the, uh, the technical details I am not struggling with, but certainly not as um, knowledgeable about. And so this has been great because it keeps bringing those technical questions back up over and over again until I get it. And one of the ways I studied in college was by making my own flashcards. And this is working really well for me because it's exactly in the same format. The exam is multiple choice. Uh, you do um, really need to take it in person. They have some online options available, but somebody is going to be watching you take the exam remotely because they wanna make sure you're not cheating on the exam. So it's probably easier just to uh, look on the ARRL website for a local exam site and go and take it. And I think uh, this ham test online has been really helpful for me and I think might be for many of you. I'm not getting an affiliate link for this or anything. It's just something that I purchased and so far am quite happy with. And they also guarantee that you'll pass the exam. And if you don't, they'll give you your money back. So you got nothing to lose there. Now, there are three levels of license. Uh, the first one that you get is the technician license, which is what I am studying for now. Uh, there will be 35 questions on the exam. Again, no Morse code. 
And once you pass that exam, uh, you can then access frequencies above 30 megahertz. So it is limited in the sense that you can't use some of those longer distance frequencies. After you get your technician license, you move on to the general license and then to the extra license. And with each license, you get uh, more privileges on the areas of the radio spectrum that the FCC has allocated for amateurs. And you can take a look at this chart here from the ARRL about all the different frequencies that amateurs have access to and what license you need to do certain things on them. Now, not to put the cart before the horse, but I am also shopping for radios, given that things are hard to get these days. So the radio that Trent picked up is this one, an Anytone uh, ATD87UV2+. And apparently this is a really good entry-level radio, at least from what I've been reading. And I would love to hear some advice from all of you. Uh, what's neat about this one is that it supports uh, DMR, which is a digital mode, so you can communicate digitally or with a regular old analog uh, type of transmission. Additionally, it supports packet radio, and it has GPS circuitry built in, so you can use it mobile to let other packet radio listeners know uh, that you are out and about. So it kind of does everything that I want to play around with initially, and of course you can plug your computer into it and send other uh, protocols out as well. So I'm looking at this one. Again, I want to get some opinions from all of you. Trent did a lot of research on the radio that he ended up picking, which is this one. So uh, I will probably be getting one once I get my exam date uh, locked in. And uh, then uh, I'll be able to get on that uh, radio once my record shows up in the FCC database, but not before. So lots to learn here still, an exam to take. But this is why I am interested in the whole ham radio thing. And hopefully I will have some content for you as I'm working my way through this process. And there's a lot of great YouTube channels out there. Uh, Frugal Radio and Signals Everywhere are two that I've been looking at a lot, especially for some of the software defined radio stuff. And as I find more and learn more, I will share all of these experiences with you. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. And I wanna thank a super chatter Joe Troiani, who contributed during one of our live streams the other day. I want to thank Joe and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. And hopefully we'll have a lot more to talk about here on the channel as I get into this whole radio thing. If you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel through my donor box page. We also support Patreon, Floatplane, and the YouTube membership program. I've got a bunch of other channels that you can find me on, including my Amazon shop, where you can find a lot of my videos ad-free, along with my live streams. And then, of course, you can engage with the channel with my very infrequent email list at lon.tv email. We also have a pretty active Facebook group. We're pretty active on Discord, and I've got a Telegram channel, too, because why not? And if you are looking to get a good deal on stuff, I sell things that I have reviewed here on the channel for prices lower than new because the items were used for the review. These are things that I purchased to review here. And if you want to get alerted every time I add something to the store, you can go to lon.tv slash store alert and you'll get an email every time something gets added. Or you can just visit the link at lon.tv slash store every once in a while to see if anything is up there. That is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I hope you all have a great week and we'll be back with a lot more tech content and I'll keep you posted on my ham radio status. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Jim Tannis and Tom Albrecht, Hot Sauce and Video Games and Eric's Variety Channel, Brian Parker and Frank Goldman, Amda Brown and Matt Zagaya, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv s.